All right. I guess that's one time that progress really is a positive thing. Okay. So we're going to begin with Parashat Bimidbar. And I want to start with the very first pasuk. The very first pasuk in Sefer Bimidbar. So this is the pasuk I'm reading and then translating. By the Be'er Shem, El Moshe, the Midbar Sinai, Be'ol Mo'ed, Be'echad, Lachodesh HaShemim. Translation, interpretation. Hashem spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai, Bimidbar Sinai, in the tent of meeting, the Ohel Moed, the Echad Lechodesh Hasheni, on the first of the second month. So, which month is that? That's Chodesh Er. Nisan is the first month, Er is the second month. So, whatever is happening now is a conversation. Hashem is speaking to Moshe on Rosh Chodesh Iyar. So this is a year past. So Nisan is when they left. A whole year has passed. So the first Pesach, as it were, has passed because now we're into Chodesh Iyar of the second year. Let's say Tami Eretz Mitzrayim from their departure from the land of Egypt, saying, and then the content that follows is the content that follows. But I do want to share with you a, um, a Rashi. It's the very first Rashi in Sefer Bermikar. And I think it's worth reading it and trying to unpack a little bit of what it's about and what's the sort of messages that this first Rashi may be sharing. And we're going to take a look at a couple of different Parshanim and the way in which they understood this Rashi and the message in general. So Rashi says this, So while you and I have not yet read the next sections following this basuk, when we do, we will see that the content of this first section is Hashem telling Moshe, that he should conduct a census of the Jewish people. A census of the Jewish people. So toward understanding that, Rashi says, it is out of love, Hashem's love of the Jewish people, that Hashem counts them at every moment. So what Rashi is telling us is that this is not the first time since they left Egypt 13 months ago that there's a census. But the reason for another census is because Hashem had deep affection for the Jewish people. When they left Mitzrayim, he counted them. And that you can find in chapter 12 of Sefer Shemot. And following the Egel Hazahav, and you remember that there was a bit of an internal war, and 3,000 Jews fell or killed as a result of their participation. With the Eagle and Zahav. So, following that section, that story of the Eagle and Zahav in chapter 32, the Torah reveals that there was a census. So, after Eagle and Zahav, the debacle there, Hashem asked, instructed another census in order to figure out who remained follow that, following that story. And when Hashem wanted to rest his divine presence upon them with the completion of the Mishkan in the desert, there was also a census. And last, again, we just talked about this being Rosh Kodesh Iyar. So one month prior to this, in the history of the of B'nai Israel's departure, they left the Nisan. And the next year, on the first of Nisan, the Mishkan was inaugurated, Hanukkah Mishkan. And then one month later, which is where our Parsha picks up, on Rosh Chodesh, E.R., Hashem says, I want you to count them again. So the beginning of Sefer B'mibar clearly marks the third time in just over a year that Hashem ordered the nation to be counted. And if you take a look at Rashi, again, Rashi is explaining to us that the reason that there's another census in 13 months, that's a lot, is because Hashem loves them so much. 
Okay. But it's worth, I think, just taking a pause and once again, considering what the three points are in the history of the Jewish people in these 13 months that prompted Hashem to say, I want to count you. And then what would the message be? Again, and one of the things you know about the way in which I study Kumash and I try to impart in my shiurim is that if the only thing we were to understand from this is that 3,300 years ago, Hashem asked there to be a census of a group of people who no longer are alive, that would be interesting, but it may not be so significant to our lives in the year 2023 living in Toronto. There's no desert. So what's the impact that upon us on a census that took place for the third time so long ago? So what I hope that we'll be able to do as we move through understanding this section is to derive some meaning in the census or at least in the message of the census that actually does have meaning for us in the year 2023, Tafshin Pei Gimel 5783. So let's take a look again at the three circumstances around which, according to the Midrash Rashi quotes, Hashem asked for a census. So we see here that there are three occasions. When they left Egypt, the sin of the golden calf, and the notion of Hashrat Hashchina, which was one month prior to this. One month prior to this, the Hashrat Hashchina. So what are the differences between these three? So let's start with the first one. Chronologically, is they left Egypt. They left Egypt, there was nothing particularly, I guess, merit, meritorious about the Jewish people. They left Egypt. Um, they left, they were young as a nation, I mean. They were young, they were helpless. They were like a child cared for by their parent. You could even say they really haven't done anything to deserve it. Yes, there were certain things that they did uh, right in order to prepare for the Yitziat Mitzrayim, that whole first Seder. But that act in and of itself was, compared to 210 years, was, I guess, significant. But it's only one act out of 210 years. So they, they were not... They, they didn't have a lot of virtues to extol, and Hashem recognized that. In fact, one of the Chachamim I mean, tell us that that might have been one of the reasons that Hashem wanted them to do certain things in thought in order to somehow be, uh, mm. to be more um, meriting the whole notion of Yitzhak Mitzvah, because Hashem looked at them and found them somewhat wanting. Mm. But in any event, that was their first, that was the first counting. Like a parent who has to deal mm. with a child who needs their help. Like a parent who needs to guide children like a parent who is sort of showing the kids the way. Then they get to Har Sinai. And while at Har Sinai, as our Chachamim sort of dramatically describe it, the Jewish people participate, only some of them, maybe not everybody, but not an insignificant number, participate in what Hashem thought to be a dramatic, example of betrayal. So here is Hashem revealing himself. He's done all in Nisim and Mitzrayim, a year's worth of Makot, Kriya Yamsu, fire, the 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 uh, the pillar of of, um, of Ananea Kavod, the fire at night, like all of these things that they're seeing on a daily basis, the fire. And all of a sudden they do what? All of a sudden they sort of turn around and they start somehow praying to a calf, which some of them, for Shem, say is Avodah Zarah, and yes, it's true that some say not, but it's clear in Hashem's response that whatever it was, it just was, oh it, it was such a painful, painful moment for Hashem because he felt that they, that the Jewish people really turned their back on him. So that's a time following which Hashem counts them. There is a war, people die. The third time is with the Mishkan. This is so different, isn't it? This isn't helpless anymore. This is where the Jewish people were called upon to sort of show their love of God and to part with some of their wealth in an act of contribution towards the building of the Mishkan. And they jumped all over this. So much so that we hear 
from the people in charge today at the Yelp Motion to tell them to stop. We've got so much more Dayambo there. We even have more than we need to build a Mishkan. Oh, that must have been an extraordinary moment where Hashem shows himself to the Jewish people. So if you take a look at these three things and you think about them, there's a deeper message than just Hashem wanting to count that generation of Jews at those three times. Their helplessness, leaving the trying, the census following the Eagle Hazahab, and the census, as it were, at the time, uh, shortly around the time of the building of the Mishka. So what's the message? The message, I think, is this. That Hashem wants to count the Jewish people, and he loves them. That's the language of this Midrash. He loves them. He loves them? Wasn't he angry with them? Wasn't Hashem disappointed? Wasn't Hashem looking at the Jewish people after 210 years and saying, oh my gosh, look how they've fallen from what Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov accomplished and what they represented. The gender descendants of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov didn't turn out perhaps the way neither Avram expected, Yitzhak expected, or Yaakov expected. And yet Hashem counts them. Why? According to this Midrash, because he loves them. And following the Egel of Zahab, where God was so upset with them at some point, he said, I want to get rid of them. Moshe, that's it, finished. You'll be my, my the, the, the founder of a new nation. Of course, that's not what happened. Hashem found a way to forgive them. But not only did Hashem find a way to forgive them, the Midrash, I think, implies and what she suggests, is he began to love them again. And he wants to count them. And you count the things that have value. You count the things that you want to hold on to. How much do I have? How many diamonds do I have? Is it seven? Is it eight? What? Is, how many carats is it? Oh, I want to make sure that I don't skip any dollar. I want to make sure that I got all the money. And then when the Mishkan was built, oh my goodness, when the people stepped up in such a huge, enormous way and began to sort of um, anticipate the greatness of the moment of accepting God with the, the inauguration of the Mishkan, Shem says, I love you. I love you. It's amazing. And so the story of Hashem doing that is a story of, I guess, parents loving their children no matter what. And of course, that's not an old thing, is it? It's a new thing. And maybe that was our story when we were growing up and we think about, oh my gosh, did I give my mother out of the snackish? And oh boy, I can remember the time that my father, da 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 da. And, well, and then I have kids. You know, it's a shame. Maybe you have kids or grandchildren and you're going through those things. And there may be times of frustration. There may be times of joy. There may be times of upset, maybe even anger. There may be time of intense nachas. And all of those things, all of them, are still connected by this thread of chiba, by this thread of love. And I just want to share with you a, a quote. I've, in doing some research, I, I end up reading all sorts of interesting explanations and drushes of rabbis. So I found a drusha. A rabbi whose name is Rabbi Israel Polyev. He was a rabbi who lived in the United States uh, in the 1950s. He also became uh, very active in the RCA. He was a chaplain in the United States Army, especially after World War II. He was stationed in Japan. He came back. He was a rabbi in Pennsylvania. He was a rabbi in New York. Anyways, he has a whole collection of his own drushes. And I'm just going to quote one paragraph from one of his drushes on this pursuit. Um, and I think it's it's worth considering. He says, we all want to bat 1,000 in our lives. So for those of you who like baseball, batting 1,000 means like you never miss anything. You are the best ever. We all want to bat 1,000 in our lives, but none of us will. We keep on trying. And this we must do in our religious life as well. No one demands of you to be perfect, but you can demand of yourself an honest attempt at Torah commitment to the fullest extent. Of one thing you can be sure, Torah Judaism always welcomes you to gain an element of the eternal by becoming part of an eternal faith. You can't always score a home run. We know that. We're going to fail. We're going to falter. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. We may say something wrong. We may do something wrong, just like B'nai Yisrael did. But this Rashi is telling us Hashem's attitude towards them should be our attitude, his attitude towards us, and our attitude towards Hashem. Meaning, even if we screw up, even if we make mistakes, if we do something which seems to be terrible, 
Not so positive. So what are we going to do? You're going to say, that's it. I made a mistake. There's no redemption. I can't go back. I can't face this person. I can't do it. The answer is no. Even after something as, if you think about it, as so upsetting and so devastating as Chayfa Ayo, which to this day has really never, ever left the sort of liturgy of the Jewish people in our consciousness. There's still things we do out of Yomazet that reminds us of the Chayda Ego, things we shouldn't be doing, things we should be doing. So it's still part of our tradition, still part of our theological awareness. So after that, is there any comeback? Is there any tshuva? Can we, the answer is yes, there is. And Hashem wants to count the Jewish people. Mitoch chibatam. Mitoch chibatam lepanav mone otam kol sha'ach. Hashem's chiba remains constant at all times, regardless of the circumstances. And even when we may not necessarily deserve it. So, as I said, that's not an ancient message. I think that's a very common message. And maybe, I'm just saying this in the context of parenting and the challenges that parenting gives. And I don't know, I don't, I'm sure that everybody in this call, I, maybe I'm wrong, may not be uh, in the stage of the life where they're active parenting young children. But just remember this, if Hashem if Hashem treats us as a father the way we treat our children, will that be good for us or not? I'm not sure. For some of us, it'll be amazing. But for some of us, it may be, whoa, wait a second. I want Hashem to treat me the way I treat my kids. Do I treat my kids in the manner that I want to be treated? Do I want, am I a forgiving father? Am I a father who embraces his kids? Am I a father who can get angry but can say, you know what? I want to have a relationship with you. And so how can we work it out? Or am I going to be the stern father says, no, out of the house, goodbye. Unfortunately, as you know, there are too many stories of the second. But the way in which we treat each other and our family members and our friends and community, that's the way Hashem is going to be measuring his relationship with us. But I want to share a different uh, take on this with you. And for this, I want to share the words of Rav Moshe ben Nachman. Rav Moshe ben Nachman in his Perush on this pursuit, actually it's a long Perush, and he suggests some really interesting explanations, three explanations as to why Hashem spent effort on the senses. Again, like what's the point of that? The Hashem that knows everything, the Hashem that knows all, why does he need the senses? In some ways, of course, you can say, well, actually, he doesn't. Hashem knows everything. So what? He, he didn't know the number. He wanted to see what the number was. Oh, thank you. And in some sort of heavenly book, he's recording the number that he would not have known otherwise. Of course not. So Ramban comes up with three answers. And I'm actually going to work backwards. I'm going to start with the third answer that he gives and then work up towards the first answer that he gives. The third answer, it makes so much sense. And that is, it's a practical strategy. Practical. Why is it practical? So according to the chronology of Sefer Bimibar, this happened, Parshat um, Bimibar obviously happens before Parshat Shlach. It happens before Moshe sends the Miraglim to Eretz Yisrael. Why is that significant? It's significant because according to the original plan, B'nai Israel were supposed to leave Egypt and make their way north to go straight into Israel. They weren't supposed to walk all around and have to then end up on the east side of the Jordan, cross the Jordan, get to Yericho. That was unnecessary. That was the punishment for what the Moroccan have done and the Jewish people's collective crying and refusal and rejection of Eretz Israel. That was the punishment. But we haven't reached that point. Meaning that in the divine plan that existed right now, the Israel were going to make their way shortly into Eretz Israel. So then what? So then, okay, here's a practical piece of information. How many soldiers will make up our army? They're going to encounter Shiva and Rami. They're going to encounter people, nations in the land who may not simply want to fold up and make peace. There may be some nations who are going to go out to war, military conflict. Yes, that's exactly what happened. There was a nation, the Girgashim, who made peace with the Israel. 
but that wasn't the story. All of Sefer Yoshua, seven years of conquest preceding the seven years of apportioning the land to the Shvatim, but seven years of fighting. So if you're going to encounter an enemy that's going to fight, at least get your army in order. And what's your army? Figure out how many soldiers you have. And how old should a soldier be? 20 years old. That's what the census is. Count everybody from the age of 20 and up. And an indication that that would reasonably be an explanation as to why the census was important is the fact also in Parsha Bimbar, there's one group of Jews. They weren't counted. They weren't part of the census. And who were they? The Levine. They had their own census. But why should the Levine be excluded from the national uh, census? And the answer is because the Levine did not serve in the army. They had different jobs. They were servicing the, the Mishkan. They had a religious service, but they didn't have military service. So the fact that the Levi'im were not counted in the general census is, I think, a proof to Ramban's explanation that the whole one of the main reasons for the census was practical, strategic, military considerations. You don't rely on miracles. That's a fundamental notion in Jewish belief. We don't rely on miracles. No, we're not counting. Hashem, you go out there, you take care of it and come back. We'll have coffee together at 4 p.m. after it's all over. That's not the way it's going to happen. We don't rely on Nisim. We do not rely on miracles. And so this particular message that Ramban, I think, was implying is to teach us that there is a balance. We need to navigate between two poles, trust and reliance on Hashem, we always have to, and self-help. The idea that we have to do is it said our Ishtalos. We have to do that which is part of our obligation as being human beings, as being faithful Jews. We have our jobs to do. So according to explanation number one, that's what was going on here. The census was the Jewish response to military preparedness. Okay, that's his last answer. His second answer, which is his middle answer, is this. When you do a census, what is the process? Well, it's clear. Your job is to count every person. Okay. And why is that significant? The significance, says the Ramban, lies in the message that everybody is seeing. We're not leaving people out. We're not ballparking ballparking it. And so I know that I said before, what we're counting are those people who are 20 years old and, uh, and above. That's true, because that might have been an explanation as to the military significance of the nation. But even if it was just that portion of the population that we're counting, we're counting every person. Every person going out to battle, every person matters. Every person who's going to represent us matters. I guess today you could say the same thing about Sahal. Is there any soldier that we would not govern for? Yeah, well, he's part of a big group, so it doesn't matter. You know, no, Chas Vashon. Every one of the, Jew, the the precious neshamas of the men and women of Israel are going out or defending the, the land, the state of Israel, they count. Of course they do. And that's what Ramban is saying here. It confers honor and greatness on each one of the individuals. It emphasizes the census. It emphasizes the value of each individual. No one is lost in the vastness of the collective. That may be true in other situations, maybe in other cultures, but not for us, not for Hashem. I love everyone individually, and I love the nation collectively. And to show that relationship, to show that the individual is to be given dignity and honor and value, I want to count each one. That's the Ramban's second explanation. But again, you know, in some ways, this isn't just an, an ancient message. I think it's true for everybody. How do we find our place in the group? And that, I think, sometimes is a struggle for all of us in the various settings that we find ourselves. Sometimes it's professional, sometimes it's social. Um, it's, it's not always easy. It isn't. Sometimes when you're in a big, vast room, as you know, sometimes and there's a lot of people you're not sure where you belong, so you end up in a little corner because you think you're just one part of a big scene and you're not sure that you get noticed. So you might have had that feeling and that experience. And that's what the census is trying to push back against. But that's not the first reason. 
the first reason that the Ramban lists is the last one that I'm giving, but going in reverse order, this is the first one he says. He says that the first reason, the first reason for the census is that if you actually do the census and you figure out the numbers, you realize, oh my gosh, the miracle of our existence has to be recognized. The end of Sefer Breshit, Yaakov Avinu reluctantly, but under duress, Anus al Hadibur, as the Haggadah tells us, leaves Eretz Yisrael to go into Eretz Mitzrayim. And how many people go all together? Number is 70. That's it. 70 people. 70. And then you read Parshat Bimidbar and you read every tribe and the thousands and the thousands of people, the thousands, and you realize, my gosh, that in spite of all of the suffering, in spite of all the attempts to decimate us, to destroy us, to vanquish us, we're here. We're here in not only little numbers, we're here in big numbers. And we can be counted. And the numbers are going to be impressive. And I sometimes feel that way now as well. That after the extraordinary loss of the Shohan, six million, like the, ma the mathematical implications of how many Jews would be in the world had we not lost six million is extraordinary. But then you look at what we're accomplishing now with our depleted numbers. And we count. Boy, do we ever count. And I'm not going to fail to count every Jew because we matter and we make a difference. And whether it's the Nobel Prizes that we disproportionately represent, the more Jews who won Nobel Prizes from the smallest of nations than other ethnic groups, but that's because we matter. And I think that's the message that Ramban is trying to say is that the miraculous nature of the Jewish people is extraordinary. The year 2023, and we're still here. Other civilizations have gone, Rome has gone, Greece has gone, Disney, like all of the, the other sort of great superpowers of history that look to be so daunting and so powerful and so culturally influential, and they were. But we're still here. And we remain culturally influential, and we create, and we contribute, and we do so many things that the rest of the world benefits from. So according to the Ramban, that's the reason that this census matters so much. Okay, I'm going to go on a little bit more. So we're going to go on to Pasuk uh, 52. Still, still Parakala. Still go Parakala. So going to Pasuk 52, when the Torah is, again, describing the census and all the numbers and how the camp is populated. And then the Torah says the following. Bnei Israel shall encamp every man at his camp and every man at his banner according to their legions. And the Leviim shall encamp around the tabernacle, around the Mishkan Haidut, so that there shall be no wrath upon the assembly of the children of Israel. And the Leviim shall safeguard the watch of the Mishkan Haidut. Okay. So it tells us here that everybody encamped again, Ish al Machaneu, every man at his camp. And then it says, Ve Ish al Diglo, Diglo, Degel Shalo, every person with his flag. So where did flags come from? Like, what, what the, where, where do we find flags? So, the Midrash tries to explain that and offers an interesting idea. So the Midrash, the Midbar Rabbah, the second parak of the Midbar Rabbah on Sefer the Midbar, says, well, here's the background to that. So it says that when Hashem um, had given the Torah at Har Sinai, so that happened, of course, a little, that a year ago, it happened in the month of Sivan, the seventh day, the sixth day, the seventh day of Sivan. So the Midrash says, 
220,000 angels descended from, descended with Hashem, as it were, from the top of Hashem to our Sinai, and they were arranged according to flags. So, in some sort of prophetic vision that was seen by the entire nation. So Har Sinai was not just a oral moment hearing what was the uh, Aseret and Dibra, but they also beheld something, obviously in a deeply, intensely powerful spiritual manner. And the Midrash says what they sort of saw was this huge host of angels, each one carrying some sort of flag. Um, and this experience apparently suggests the Midrash of Ben Israel seeing this heavenly arrangement of flags made a very deep impression on the Neshavas. And when Ben Israel saw all of these Malachim standing around the mountain, as it were, with flags, they began to think, wow, we would like that. We want to look like that. We want to have that experience. So Hashem saw how the people at that moment yearned to be more like the angels that they perceived in that spiritual sense. And so Hashem said, if that's what you want, I will arrange that for you. And so in Parshat Bin Midbar, in our this Parsha this tonight, this Shabbos, Hashem says, I'm now going to arrange you. Yes, I'm going to arrange you with, with flags, not 220,000 flags, but I'm going to arrange the entire camp with, so that people have their own flags. Okay. So what's this represent? What does this idea represent? So let's think about this. What does a flag do? Well, it certainly identifies you. And the flags are different. The flags are, I mean, they may have similarities, but each flag somehow has its own peculiar shape, color to it, as Rashi says, according to I mean, there is something different about every person's flag. So, when everybody has their own flag, oh, this is my flag, and I'm standing right here, it's a way of identifying not only who you are, but where you are. This is my spot. So, the flags are not simply just an identification to make you feel good, but it also has, in some ways, a socially practical implication. It identifies my space, and in identifying my space, it means you know where you should go. It helps us structure ourselves physically in a spatial sense to create some sort of harmonious relationship, that everybody has their own space. And when we often end up fighting is when I want somebody else's space and I fail to recognize, identify, or respect another person's space. But the the inclusion of these flags in the way in which B'nai Israel created the camp with the Mishkan in the center is also a way of creating social order. And the Midrash, the Midrash is teaching us that the flags brought a sense of individuality and distinctiveness. And it may seem ironic, but somehow when you create individuality and distinctiveness, you also enable um, peaceful relations and goodwill among people. So when you think of goodwill, you think of community, and community comes from the word unity. And so unity seems to suggest singularity. But if you want that type of singularity of harmony, in order to achieve that, you do, however, have to make sure that everybody knows their proper place. So without individual banners, if we fail to recognize that each person is assigned his or her unique role and unique set of circumstances, then we're going to continue to have unhealthy competition and unhealthy struggles. And if everybody is the same, then I'm entitled to everything. There's no, there's no border. So these flags then become important markers for us. So I want to share with you an interesting side to this that um, Rabbi Zalman Sarotskin, 
shares in his commentary to the Torah called Oznayim La Torah. So, one minute. <clears throat> Later on in the Chumash in chapter in Eric Beit, Pasuk Lamedal 234, the last Pasuk in Eric Beit, Torah says, Vaya Asu Bene Israel Kehol Asher Tziva Hashem et Moshe. And Ben Israel did everything that Hashem had commanded Moshe. Kain chanu ledigleihem v'chein nasu v'chein nasau ish lemishvechotav al beit avotav. So again, they Ben Israel did everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, and they encamped according to their banners, just like we've been talking about. And they journeyed every man according to his families by his father's household. So we think the way the Torah describes it is definitely a description of order. A couple of things here. The last phrase in this pasuk, Ishla Mishpochotav, every man according to his family, and Ish uh, and um, Al Beit Avotav, according, but every man according to his families. By his father's household, al Beit Avotav. Okay, so the fact that the Torah says to you, they did exactly as they were told. But so they did. They did exactly as they were told. So the Torah seems to want to suggest, maybe even emphasize, that the Nisro are very mindful of this instruction about the banners and the order. And you wonder, well, why why would you have expected that not to be the case? Would you not have expected the Jewish people to do everything that Hashem instructed? Yes, it's true that there are times that they didn't, but would it make more sense to say, let's tell us when they didn't do what they were expected to do, but every time that Hashem told them to do something, I have an expectation of compliance. So just tell me about the non-compliance. Don't tell me about the compliance. But here the Torah says, no, no, no. It was, com they complied. Almost as though the Torah wants you to know, whoa, they complied. Why? Because you might have expected them not to comply. So it's here that Rabbi Zalman Sarotskin offers a really interesting insight that, again, you know, the, the rabbis are not only trying to explain a text written 3,300 years ago, the rabbis are also trying to understand why this text continues to serve as a guide for our lives in every single generation. And so, I'm going to, <clears throat> I want to share this with you. So he says, Rabbi Sarotskin, who's not in the Torah, again, Rabbi Sarotskin is a more, I guess, contemporary. He's a Holocaust survivor settled in Israel following the war. So he had a, a perspective, I guess, post-Holocaust and saw some terrible things that uh, we've read a lot, so much about. So he says the following, You have to remember, he says, that the Jewish people themselves wanted those flags, just like the Midrash we talked about. They really did. They, 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 they felt that those flags were going to make them, you know, feel good. They wanted it. So if Hashem says, grants you, okay, I'm going to give you the flags, you get what you want. So of course they would have done what Hashem asked. Hashem gave them what they wanted. Thank you. Well, whatever you want, Hashem, we're up, we're up there. Says Reb Zerotskin, the reason that the Torah tells us specifically that they did what they were told to do. Shalom caused too because nobody argued. Nobody said, no, no, I want to be a facing east. No, no, I want to be in the western side. Mom, you first. I, no, 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 you're not going to put me second. You're not, you can't put me there. And then he adds in brackets, who gets Like we sometimes behave in shul. That's my seat. That's the seat. Have you ever been to a simcha and you had good, I want a good table. 
that they put you at a good table. What does that mean? They put you at a good table. You have a table. We have a chair. You're in the hall. You're at the Bali Simcha. Everybody's together. What do you mean a good table? That's exactly the point. You've heard that phrase. But they put me at a good table. That's exactly what Rabbi is going to say. That's the mentality. Yes. You're going to put me somewhere special. You're going to put me there. I don't want to be there. Who do you think you are to put me over there? He says, but nobody argued. They did everything. They were put, they stood where they were told to stand. They went where they were told to go. It's a miracle that nobody had any arguments. And that's what he says. And then he goes on to explain a little bit about a textual, <clears throat> excuse me, oddity in the Pasuk. He says, when you take a look at the language that often appears when it talks about fathers' households, which was one of the ways in which things were organized. Sarotskin so says that the phrase is usually le bait avotav with a lamed, le bait avotav. But if you take a look at the pasuk that we're talking about, parak bait pasuk lamed dalit, it doesn't say le bait avotav, it says al bait avotav. Now, I don't know if I would have noticed that that's such a big change, but he stops to ponder why that's so. And he says, hello. Lo davar reiku. He says, this isn't an empty sort of thing. There's a reason for it. So what does he say? One minute. And nobody argued. Vizesha mark on vechena so and that... And the, the reason for the Pasuk stating Nasau and so did they travel, not only did they camp according to the instructions, they also traveled. The Lohit quoted to Benihem, and they didn't argue and quarrel between them. Mi Barosh, who came first, Al Beit Avutav. Al, he says, Smach Hatzivaash al Beit Avutav. Al, in this case, he says, is like the phrase Al Smach, based on. All based on the order or the last will and testament that they received from Beit Avotav. What are we talking about, Beit Avotav? They're talking about Yaakov Avinu. They're talking about the instruction of Yaakov Avinu, the house of their father, who gave instruction as to how his casket, his body, should be carried, and who should stand where, and who should go what. He Yaakov told the boys, this is what I want. And so says Rabbi Saratskin, the fact that Yaakov had many years ago created this notion of this is where you go and this is where you go, that's what this was about. That's why it says Al Beit Avotav, regarding, regarding and connected to the order that they had received from before. Who's going to stand on the east side of Yaakov Avinu's casket? Who's going to, well, he didn't have a casket. Who's going to stand on the east side of his body? Who's going to stand on the west? Who's going to be north? Who's in the south? That was already established. And that's why it says that word al. And so where we sit, where we stand, which table we're at, oh my goodness, people get so upset about that. And remember this pasuk, that's not a reason to get upset. We need order. Everybody needs their place. And the miracle was that all of the children, all of the brothers, everybody, 600,000 at least people accepted it. And they managed to live with it. And they had harmony. Nobody was upset at the spot that they got. Talk about a Musr message. Whoa. Okay. Let's go on. I'm going to move now to Herrick Gimel. Herrick Gimel. Pasuk Lamid Chet. 38. If you're with me with a Humash, that's wonderful. If not, again, as you know, it's not 100% necessary. So the Torah now describes the, the um, tasks, the jobs that the Levi'im were assigned in the Mishkan, and later, of course, it was transferred to the Beit HaMikdash when it was built in Yerushalayim. And I'm going to read now. 
והאחרונים לפני המשכן, קדמה, לפני אוהל מועד מזרחה, משה ואהרון ובניו שומרים משמרת המקדש למשמרת בני ישראל, והזר הקרב יומת. I'm going to read now from the Stone Translation Interpretation. Those who encamped before the Mishkan to the front, before the Oho Moed to the east, were Moshe and Aaron and his sons, guardians of the charge of the sanctuary, Shomrim Mishmeret HaMikdash, for the charge of the children of Israel, Lemishmeret B'nai Yisrael, and any alien czar, someone who is not of this group, who approaches shall die. The Hazar HaKarev Yumat. So Aaron and his sons, according to this, Moshe Aaron and, and Aaron's sons, were picked to be the guardians of the sanctuary. They had that special, they, they, their job was to watch. So the Gemara Masech Tamid in Dav Chavvav points to this verse as a source for the mitzvah of Shmirat HaMikdash, requiring that a group of Kohanim and a group of Leviim must always be guarding the site of the Mikdash. That was a job, that it was a mitzvah, that there had to be a group of people guard that. That's what they get from this, from this pursuit. Shomrim Mishmeret HaMikdash. And as Moshe was a lady, and Aaron and his sons were Kohanim, their description as guarding Shomrim, the Mishkan, indicates that this job was assigned to Kohanim and to Levi'im. So remember, Moshe, although he might have wanted and aspired to be a Kohanim, he wasn't. He was a lady. The job of being a Kohen went to Aaron and through Aaron's sons. Now the Mishnah Masechet Midod, describes that there was a supervisor. His name was Ish Har Habay, the man who was responsible to supervise the Har Habay. This person would go around the areas that were identified as requiring Shmira throughout the night. That was his job. Ish Har Habay's job was to walk around all the parts of the Har Habay that were assigned to be uh, watched and guarded. And if he found a guard who had fallen asleep, he would strike the guard with his stick. You know, what, what are you doing? Get up. And this is like crazy. This is astonishing that the Mishnah also says that the supervisor was authorized, not that he did, but he was authorized to set the guard's clothing on fire if he needed to. Whoa, can you imagine that? Okay. So I've often quoted the opinions of Rav Levi Yehuda Ginsburg uh, in his collection of explanations called the Yalbu Yehuda, and I want to share one his explanation about this astonishing mitzvah. And he he often he really one of the one of the things that identifies and characterizes Rabbi Ginsburg Rabbi Ginsburg's um, explanation to to the Tchumash is his uh, ethical stanza. Interesting rabbi. He, as I, as you know, he came from Lithuania. He settled in uh, first in New York. He settled first in New York. He was then diagnosed. This was, I think, nineteen thirty. He was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and he was sent to a sanatorium in New Jersey. Nothing happened, and he then went from the sanatorium in New Jersey to the sanatorium in Denver, Colorado. And he really, really liked it in Denver because. The people in Denver were much more warm to him, and they they would connect with him, they talk with him, they visit him, and later on they would even invite him to their home. Whereas in New York and New Jersey, nobody wanted anything to do with him. So he brought his family that had remained in New York. He brought him out to Denver, and it was in Denver that he wrote his three major works. And what I'm quoting tonight, the Al Yuda, I think, was the first of his three major works that he compiled while he lived in Denver, Colorado. So inside the al Yehuda, he suggests a symbolic explanation of why a guard who fell asleep was perhaps worthy of having his clothes burned. So what, what, what does clothing do? Clothing is what gives people their dignity and respect. No, 
when you feel that you're not clothed pro uh, properly, you feel a little embarrassed. And chas v'sholom, if everybody were to take your clothes away, you know, we, we would feel not only naked physically, we would feel violated spiritually and emotionally. So clothing somehow affords us the ability to preserve our dignity and respect. And if setting fire for the for the guards' clothing was also a symbolic act. What was the symbolic act? It was the message to the guard. What was the message? That you fail to give proper respect to Hashem. If we fail to give honor to God, then we should be denied our own honor and dignity. Hashem is, you're here in the holiest part of the world, and your job was to watch and guard, not forever, but for the nighttime. And you fell asleep, okay? But that means you didn't do your job properly, and you're not honoring God properly. If you're not honoring God properly, then the consequence of you not giving honor is you should not receive honor. And in this case, possibly, says Rabbi, Rabbi Ginsburg, the idea was to lose your clothing. So it's worth noting, I think, that this type of dishonor of Hashem was committed, at least in the context of the scenario we're discussing, not through any terrible act. It's not as though the Shomer threw something or he swore or he wrote something and faced the property. The only thing that he did was fall asleep. So failing to actively honor God when we are called upon to actively honor God is a way of showing dishonor. So it's not just by what you do you can dishonor God. It's apparently by what you don't do. So the Kohanim and Levi'im were guilty of disgracing God by being lazy, by falling asleep rather than standing alert. So the lesson that I think Rabbi Ginsburg wants us to contemplate is that <clears throat> even, <clears throat> excuse me, that even sleeping on the job, and I'm going to say that in quotation marks, it doesn't always have to be literal, maybe it's even metaphor. Sleeping on the job also brings dishonor to Hashem. When we fail, when we are lazy, and we don't invest the effort that we should be investing in serving Hashem, maybe we also are dishonoring Him by showing Him, you're not worth the effort. You're not worth the effort. Imagine, imagine somebody who you love turning to you and saying, you, you, you're just not worth the effort. Oh my gosh, like, can you imagine how that would feel if somebody who you trusted, you loved, you raised, you shared, said to you, listen, I don't, I don't want to go with you to the doctor's office today. Why? You're just not worth it. It's, not, it's a waste of my time. You figure it out. Like, just take your breath away how that must make me feel. So Ginsburg may be suggesting, well, that's, that's this. That, that's this. That if you're supposed to be, if you've got this job tonight and you fall asleep, maybe it's like saying to Hashem, the same thing. Okay, we have this one life and we have opportunities from time to time to invest in ways to show respect to Hashem. When we fail to invest in that, that may be an act of disrespect. So like the Kohanim and Levi'im, we are given our post. We have our jobs to do and our individual roles, roles to play and tasks to fulfill in our community, maybe in our family, maybe in our shul, maybe in our community, maybe in our neighborhood. And if we don't fulfill our tasks properly, if we don't respond to our responsibilities with care and concern, and maybe even some active embrace of what we're doing, then maybe we are also bringing some sort of dishonor to Hashem. Okay. Uh, I'm going to end with one more Bar Torah before the evening is over. I'm going to jump to Perik Dalit. Perik Dalit Sukim 17 and 18, just at the very end of Safe of Parshat Dimibar. With the Bereshem of Moshe will I run like more. Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aaron and sang them. Al Tachritu et Shevet Mishpachot Kehati Mitach Alibiim. Don't let the tribe of Kehat, one of the tribes, of, one of the families of the Levim, don't let them be cut off from amongst the other Levim. So this is what you should do for them so that they will live. 
ולא ימותו בגישתם אל קודש הקודשים, and they won't die when they approach the holy of holies, Aaron and his sons shall come and assign them every man to his work and his burden. So the people, the Levi'im had special jobs in the Mishkan, not just to serve in the Mishkan, but to assemble the Mishkan, and when called upon during the time of the Jews' desert, to disassemble it. Okay. Everybody had a specific job assigned to them. I want to share with you an idea in a collection of the Great Torah, also by an author whom I quote a lot, <clears throat> Rabbi Dov Weinberger, the author of Shem and Atov. And in his collection called Shem and Atov on this Parsha, <clears throat> he explains, or first he reminds us that if we were to look through Midrash Rabbah on these psukim at the end of Parsha the Midbar, we would find that there was actually a fascinating disagreement between two Chachamim about the nature of the assignments given to the Levi'im uh, based on what they had to do. So if you were a Levi, what job would you want? And would there be a job that you wouldn't want? Now, looking at the end of Parashat the Midbar, the Torah tells us that there was a certain degree of danger that was associated in packing up the Arun Haidut, the holiest icon. That was the, the Arun Kodesh that contained the Shnei Luchot of Reith and the Sinsen and Amat. That was the holiest of holies. And that was a job of the certain part of the living tribe to have to pack it up. Now, is that something you would want, or that was something you didn't want? So the Midrash tells us that one Chacham said, oh my gosh, the Levi'im, nobody wanted that job. They were all scared. They were all so scared. They were scared they were going to make a mistake. They were scared that they, if they made a mistake, they would die. No, give me the menorah. Give me the shulchan. Give me the mizbeach. But don't give me. The other one. The other one said, "Really? No, can't be. Can't be." The Levim said, "Don't be the Aaron." It was the other way around. Everybody wanted to be the Schwitzer. Every give the Aaron to me. You imagine? Imagine the great privilege it would be to carry the Aaron Haidut. Who would not want that? Who would pass that up? Two very different perspectives, but it indicates that. Each one had to be given a task. So it couldn't be they just left it up to them to say, okay, guys, you work it amongst, uh, amongst yourselves, and every, this time you'll carry it, next time they'll carry it. So that's not the way it worked. It had to be specifically assigned. So Rabbi Dov Weinberger suggests something, again, a social commentary, and, and sometimes they're very spot on, and maybe you'll agree with it, and maybe you're not. He says that this idea that there might have been Levi'im who really wanted the, the honor of the Aaron, but there might have been Levi'im who would have just run as far as they could, is not, not to take the Aaron. He says that reminds him of what he considered to be a contemporary challenge in the rabbit. And I'm going to read this to you. Hashkafat Chayenu Bizman Hazed. It reminds me of the perspective of our time, which is the Kolhak Tanim Ratzin Allah Aron, that all the small minded men, and he's not talking about like height, he's talking people of less thoughtfulness and status, they seem to want to run to the Aron. And they always have these opinions. They have opinions about everything, but big opinions, big, big ideas, important ideas, ideas that matter. And all these people who may be actually not prepared and not really in a position to offer public statements, they're the ones who are always running to open their mouth to make public statements. They're going for it, even though perhaps they're not qualified. And those who perhaps are of the status, of the learning, of the midot, who could say important rulings and make comments about issues of our time, they are running away because they're afraid of rendering an opinion which may be incorrect. And say, you know what? 
I don't want to rule on its own. Get on somebody else. And they only rule on relatively minor issues that are not at the heart of the social challenges of the modern era. And they do not want to become um, involved in the serious problems of our time. The Ainlanu Elazar ben Aharon, and we don't have the Kohen Elazar ben Aharon, who, according to the Torah, gave which the Levine the tasks. Today, we don't have an Elazar. She had Sevet Ish Alavodato Velmaso, to tell everybody what their individual job is. So I wonder, I wonder if I've, you know, looking around whether what Rabbi Dov Weinberger is saying, and I'm saying this with great respect is maybe sometimes rabbis and teachers are afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of the reaction of people that may or may not be willing to accept the authority of a ruling upon them. Of people who are going to fight back, push back. I can tell you, and I'm saying this as a teacher now at a school, I know that we have teachers who are afraid to friends be afraid as they head bitten off by angry parents who don't want to hear things about their kids, who don't want them. parents who would not willingly accept the observations or opinions or the authority of the teacher, parents who know better. And if a teacher were to say something, they would say, I don't accept that, I don't buy it, you're wrong, that's not my kid, I see this. So I wonder whether or not that's true, not just in teachers and parents, but maybe it's true of rabbis and communities as well. How much, does the community want their rabbi to get up and to say this is what we should be doing? Or would they push back? So according to Rabbi Weinberger, that might have even been something at the time of the Mishkan. People saying, I don't want to take the risk. I just don't want the risk. I'd rather not. But maybe sometimes we really need that. We need those bold people to get up and to tell us things that we might not always want to hear because they're hard to hear. But if we don't have those voices, if we don't have that strength, if we don't have that clarity sometimes of another person saying to you, no, this is not right. This is the way we should do. Maybe we're missing a chance to get closer to a shame. It's just a thought and I leave that with you. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. Pete, please feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, and I hope you enjoy tonight's share on Parshat Vimy Bar. Rabbi? Hi, Charlie. Yep. Um, about the directions of east, west, north, and south with the Mishkan. Mm -hmm. We read here that Aaron and, and his children and Moshe were on the east side. Okay. Okay. Now, the east side of the Mishkan uh, was actually the, um, the doorway to the Mishkan, correct? Yeah. And, and the, um, uh, the Holy Ark was on the west side. It's, yeah, inside, right, correct. The right. other end, indeed. At the uh, other right. end, on the west side. So now my question is this. Um, when they traveled in the Midbar, okay, they were not going in a certain direction. They were going in a circle. They were going really? around. They were going from, from Har Sinai, and they were going to the west side Sorry, the east side of the Jordan. So they weren't traveling in a straight line, east or west or anything. They were going in a circle. I don't think, I don't, I don't think they're, I mean, if you're taking a look at a map and saying from the point of departure from Egypt to get to, to get to the east side of the Jordan, yes, eventually There's they, an arc. they took, the route that they took did curve. That is correct. I don't okay. know if it's exactly so, a circle, but it did curve. It's not a circle, a, an arc. Let's say an arc. Now, the question I have is, when they were going towards the Jordan, when they were in Moab and going towards the Jordan and traveling west, okay. uh, was the opening of the Mishkan 
uh, at the rear? Well, they weren't at the rear because the Mishkan, there's a machlok in the Gemara how the Mishkan was never in the rear of the camp. The Mishkan was always at the center. Well, no, I don't mean rear of the camp. I mean the 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 doorway. So the doorway. If they're facing, if they're facing the west, if they're traveling west, then mm-hmm. the Mishkan's western side, I think, would be the side that would be moving forward first, and the east side would be in the back of in the that. Back. That's the way it would be. Was correct. So, in other words, east was all. East was always. No, it, is. it was always relative to the Mishkan, not right. relative to the direction they're going. Well, north is always north, and south is always south, and east is always east. So, whatever they're traveling, the Mishkan's east would be point, pointing in an eastern direction. I think so, but I, I can't say that with absolute certainty. Because I I have not checked that thoroughly to make sure that what I'm saying to you is 100 percent correct. I have not, but that's my understanding of it. We would have to check that out. I I don't have an answer tonight. I think I think I'm right, but I would have to do more learning about that. Thank so, you. So when they were going right to the Jordan River, right, then the the closest part of the Mishkan at the Jordan. Would be the west. west. What's the west side? West, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I, I believe that to be correct. Okay. Thank you, Tito, for being here. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Milka, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan. Eva, thank see you. Thank you, Abba. Marty. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, yeah. Yes, Marty. Uh, thank you very much. Week. This came up here last morning. Is there any? Connection uh, between Midbar and Midalbar linguistically, is it the same root? It is the same root, Dalit Beit, Dalit Beit Reish. It is definitely the same root. Um, the Diborim were given in the Midbar, right? The first, that's where God spoke. But I think that. The, in my mind, like I have never done an etymological uh, research on that, uh, so I'm not 100% sure. In my own mind, the conceptual link between the two words is that in a desert without distractions, Dibur assumes much more significance. That really then communication in some ways is distilled to its more core, like the two people are there, there's nothing around, there's no other sounds, there's no other people, and therefore Midbar is the place where Diburim really become communicated with greater clarity and reception. That's what I'm thinking, but I would have to do a little bit more digging in um, language and take a look at some of the dictionaries to see if I'm right. I'm not 100% sure. One more question. I've been a Cuban where where people say you say the you say the there was no rounding in the numbers. I've heard it say there was what? No rounding. No rounding? Some of the well, <laughs> well, some people, well I've heard it say there was rounding. That's how come all the numbers are equal. Yeah, um, I mean, I, okay. you know what I mean. My question is if, if there was no rounding, like I think you said tonight, why do the numbers always end up in zeros? Yeah, so I, I happen to think that the explanation of the rounding is a more convincing argument than there is no rounding. I, I, uh, other, other before some of them before she say that it, it makes sense because the the thinking reader would notice exactly as you said what every everything ends in a zero. How is that possible? How can it be that every shave it has a exactly a, an even number num like that doesn't make sense. It's so unlikely statistically. It's unlikely. That's why I think the explanation that the Torah rounded probably is a more convincing argument. Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. I wish you a week of bracha and health and simcha. 
And I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday for Parshat Naso. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Have a good yeah. night. Good night. Good night.